All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another NGSBA webinar. My name is Michael Quidall, Marketing Manager for the New Jersey School Boards Association. And today we're going to be talking about effective scholastic esports building blocks for assembling your winning team. We're really excited about the conversation here today. Now, turning an empty classroom into an esports environment that fits students' needs is not an easy task. We'll cover how to identify, plan, and build an interactive esports environment for after school gaming, STEM curriculum, and tournaments that fits your edu educational institution. So we're really excited. Please stick around. A um, couple of things regarding the Zoom features really quickly. We are going to be using the chat function today. Um, if you want to say hi and tell us where you're from, drop it in the chat function. Um, and we're also all questioning, please use the chat functioning, uh, chat function down at the bottom of your screen towards the right side of your buttons, you will see the C, C button, that's your closed captioning functionality. Um, if you click that, it will allow you to view the closed captioning of the session. You will also be able to view and save the entire transcript of the session if you need it. Now, finally, uh, we rely heavily on our tech partners for certain types of content who are out in the district. You may be working with someone else. You may be working with SHI, who um, is, pres is presenting this morning, or you may be working with another vendor. That is totally fine. This is this webinar is for informational purposes only to help you make more informed decisions at the board table and in your district. Finally, today's session is being recorded. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email later, later this afternoon or tomorrow whenever the, uh, the recorded link is generated through Zoom, and I'll send everyone who is registered for this webinar uh, the recorded link in a follow-up email. Um, and just like all of our previous webinars, um, it will also be available through NGSBA's website under the trainings tab, click webinars, that's what you'll see this webinar along with all of the upcoming and past webinars we've had. Um, so without further ado, um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katrina Adkins, Director of Educational Strategy for SHI. Good morning, Katrina. Good morning. So happy to be here. Thank you so much, Michael. So we, it's, it's unbelievable to me that I get to sit here <clears throat> with you for the next hour and talk about one of my favorite things, which is esports. Um, so we have here today with us uh, my good friend, uh, Chris Avila. So Chris, did you want to say hello? Tell us where you're coming um, to us from. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Avila. I am a uh, English teacher at Key Fort High School in New Jersey. Uh, beyond starting uh, multiple esports programs here with the kids that I you know, teach, um, during the pandemic, I also started Garden State Esports, which is the organizing body of Scholastic Esports here in New Jersey. Uh, we have a little bit over of half the state playing in our league, uh, and so I'm excited to uh, share with you guys all that we have learned about starting you know, almost 300 programs at this point, both in state and nationally. Uh, and really, for me, the effect that it has on your students, your, your school culture, um, and, and all the wonderful benefits that come with uh, esports. Thank you so much. So again, it's it's a pleasure to be here with you today, Chris. And and for those uh, listening, I've known Chris for probably over ten years now, just from being in educational technology. So probably, I think Chris and I met years ago on Twitter, and I'm even seeing in our chat here some of, some of my other Twitter friends. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here today to talk about um, eSports. So our agenda today, we're going to um, share just a little bit um, about us. We're going to look at what is eSports? So if you're not familiar with eSports, we're going to jump right into that. We're going to look at careers in eSports various opportunities that are out there for students and how do you get started? How do you uh, how do you build a space for students? How do you get them to come? Um, so we're going to go through all of that today and again excited to be here with you. So we did get a chance quickly to introduce ourselves, but I wanted to put up some contact information in, in case you wanted to reach out to us either on LinkedIn or Twitter. And then closer to the end, I'll give you some other information on how you can reach us as well. So um, to start us off, I am Katrina Adkins, and I'm the Director of Education Strategy at SHI. Um, SHI is based in uh, New Jersey, and we are the nation's largest minority women-owned 
private companies. So I get to work every single day with uh, K-12 institutions and higher ed uh, institutions uh, in terms of, of not just esports, but around space design, uh, infrastructure, professional development, all the things that, that make um, education absolutely amazing. So again, esports is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So let's just jump right in and talk about what is esports. So if you are brand new to esports, it is short for electronic sports. Um, so I came up with some words that kind of describe esports. So if we take the first letter of E and sports, uh, I came up with endurance, self-esteem, problem solving, objectives, relationships, teamwork, and stamina. So if you had kind of a preconceived notion of esports being just a bunch of kids that get into a room and they're just playing games, well, we're going to talk today about how much more esports really is. And it embraces all of these things over on the right hand side of your screen that you see now. So, um, Chris, anything you want to add to what is esports? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that folks uh, who have heard of esports generally know that it's competitive gaming. But when we talk about scholastic esports, just like traditional sports, it's really about the whole student and how we can use their passion for gaming. Uh, to really make them better people, right? And so for me, you know, kind of when I've been doing talks like this, the thing that I've been adding is, you know, in in your in acronym, it's it's should hopefully be, you know, kind of triggering for some people to realize that it's more than just gaming. Um, and, and the stories that I have to share and the things that I've seen around a lot of what you have there, especially self-esteem, um, especially relationships. I mean, to me, at the end of the day, as a teacher, that's what matters most to me, right? That social emotional learning, that growth. Um, and esports is going to be one of those things that you can bring to your school that is going to have a dramatic impact. Um, you know, I like to throw around, uh, throw around a lot of data. Garden State Esports has almost 7,000 kids participating in it. Um, and, you know, we do surveys and stuff all the time, and th there's a lot of exciting statistics, but one of the most impactful when it comes to what is esports, um, almost half of the kids participating do not do anything else at their school but esports. And so for me, when you talk about self-esteem relationships, the fact that we're engaging kids who may not be engaged in school, I mean, we know how that leads to better learning outcomes, right? They're more likely to show up, they're more likely to do better. Um, and so for me, that's the biggest thing is that we're going beyond gaming here and we're going to provide uh, an activity, provide a space to connect kids who have maybe not ever been connected before. I love that. And you you mentioned social emotional learning, which mm -hmm. is, you know, near and dear to my heart as an educator. And, um, you know, I when I when I was creating some of these words here, I mean, we could have plugged social emotional learning into the S, you know, uh, but it's, you know, it, it was tough to kind of come up with these, but we could interchange words all over the place, I think. There's so much involved with esports, and it's it's such a feel-good um, area in, uh, in education. So Chris mentioned, um, you know, professional versus scholastic. What does that mean? You know, we think about esports as, again, kids in a room gaming and competing. Um, and so we often think of, of esports as the professional side of things. So if we do look at the professional side of esports, um, esports usually takes on the form of organized multiplayer online video game competitions. Um, it is a rapidly growing industry and we're gonna look at some of those statistics in just a moment. Um, usually there's a stream, it's live, there's broadcasters, there's commentary, it's exciting, it's fun. You have, um, you know, one of the great parts, uh, which we'll talk about on the scholastic side of things is it's all students doing this. They're the ones running the broadcast. They're the ones doing the, the, the shout casting and uh, it makes it just extremely exciting. Um, in terms of professional esports, there's awards, prize money, um, all kinds out there. It's actually amazing to watch the growth in terms of the awards and uh, prizes that have been happening over the last few years. Um, 
we have uh, rivals within esports, and uh, just like we do with the traditional American sports. So if you think about, you know, the NFL, uh, NBA, you know, there's there's traditional rivals, and it's the same with esports in in the professional world. Um, and so when we look to some of the, the growth aspects of esports and really what's happening, um, there were close to 3 billion players across the globe last year. So obviously that number has grown and continues to grow every single year. Um, globally, the market will grow um, uh, to reach 218.7 billion in 2024. Um, just incredibly large numbers. Um, the growth is just astronomical. Um, esports has the second highest viewership. This is often uh, an area that a lot of people don't know. Um, NFL has the highest viewership overall, um, as you would expect, but esports comes in second, which is incredible. Um, the top 100 public game companies produced a combined revenue of $166.3 billion in 2020. That continues to grow. Um, we see the lines between esports and traditional sports continuing to blur. We're seeing esports come in as uh, more of a traditional sport now. Uh, and we're going to talk about how that might impact your program at your school shortly. Um, and then we also get into conversations around the metaverse and the anticipation around the metaverse, what that means in terms of esports uh, and investments and sales, because those are all starting to uh, come together. So, uh, Chris, I'll actually throw this back to you because I know, you know, when we talk about esports versus sports, um, you and I got into a conversation a few days ago uh, about how they compare. And so, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, I mean, so here's the reality is um, I've coached high school wrestling for more than a decade, and I would make the argument that wrestling is the most inclusive traditional sport out there, right? Um, I have had wrestlers who have had Down syndrome. I've had blind wrestlers, deaf wrestlers. I've had wrestlers who have been missing limbs, um, but we always found a way to get those kids on the map, right? And the growth that they showed is the same as every other athlete. What I love about esports is it's more inclusive than wrestling. Um, it's more inclusive than traditional sports because there's not that physicality to it. Um, a lot of people are surprised that one of the things that we do through Garden State Esports is we have our middle school state champions play our high school state champions in a battle of the champions. And it's 50-50, halftime middle school wins, half the time high school wins. And that's because right there's that competition without the physicality. So you're able to get more kids involved who are maybe emotionally uh, or physically unable to participate in traditional sports. And again, because I love the numbers, 12% uh, of Garden State esports are students who have a physical uh, or uh, um, other disability that keeps them from playing traditional sports. But they've been able to find a home in their school and, and find their uh, tribe through esports. And so you know, I think that's one of those things um, I always try to stress is uh, if you have ever been an athlete, right, it's easy to say that you have learned a lot about life uh, and improved, you know, yourself through sports, through competition, through being part of a team. All of those things happen in esports, but it's able to happen for more kids uh, because esports isn't a video game club right? It isn't just kids getting together and gaming with no purpose, right? This is competition, hopefully against other schools in your area. And just the way that teams bond and, and come together, um, you know, they do so in esports, right? And, and I'll tell you this quick story, Katrina, because it's one of my favorite stories ever, is, you know, again, even when I talk to my own kids, I pull my own kids, I gave them a survey. And, I, you know, one of the things we discuss is what was your favorite part of being part of the esports team? And what they all said was getting pizza together after matches. And I didn't even know they were, I didn't even know they were doing that. They would play a match. And then one of the moms would, you know, pay for the pizza and the team would walk to the pizza place. And so it just goes to show you that, you know, you can use this just like, you know, traditional sports, put them on the morning announcements, have them walk in the pep rally, include these kids, and you're going to see a whole host of benefits, just like in traditional sports. But again, for a kid who maybe, uh, you know, doesn't have that connection yet. So for me, right, it's all about making sure these kids find their place. 
I love that. And Chris, I have a, a question for you and you have to be honest here. How do high school students feel about being beat by middle school students? Uh, they, it's, it's, it's almost often like they think it's impossible. <laughs> they, they can't believe. Like when we just yeah. did the sports association um, tournament together a few yeah. weeks ago, my high school team lost to a middle school team, right? And it was the first tournament they've ever played in it. You know, I just started the program here in Keyport when I got here in September. And on the way home on the bus, they were like, we lost to middle schoolers. <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, yeah, because yeah, you, did. you did because and it wasn't even close. I said, skill in esports isn't necessarily, you know, because I got some big kids here. Um, you know, skill in esports isn't necessarily based on physicality. So right. anybody can beat anybody because it's a pure competition on an equal playing field of skill. I love that. And that's yeah. so different from, from traditional sports, one Absolutely. of the aspects that I that I just love. So mm -hmm. something else that came about last year, Chris, was I saw this on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And this tells us how big esports is getting. I mean, it's on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Yeah, I mean, Unreal. Even, even the fact that it's Sports Illustrated, because you get into that debate of, well, are esports athletes athletes? And if you follow the, the training regimen, the commitment, the dedication that top tier esports players go through, you know, people are shocked to learn. And even in my own program, we start off our practices with physical movement. We start stretching, we do warm ups. Um, you know, we talk about diet, sleep, and exercise, which is the performance triad and how that affects in game performance and also affects how they do in school. And so if we can help these kids develop healthy gaming habits, right? Going to sleep on time. You know, parents love, I talk about all the time when it's time to turn the screens off. I tell my kids they need to spend half an hour at least outside, you know, uh, or as the kids say, touching grass. Um, and so, you know, esports athletes have a lot in common with uh, uh, high level athletes. I'll even tell you um, for the book that we wrote, I got to uh, interview Amon Green, you know, unbelievable running back for the Green Bay Packers, but he's also, you know, the head coach now of Lakeland University's esports team. You know, I asked him directly for the book when I interviewed him was, um, are esports athletes athletes? And if so, are they on the caliber of NFL athlete? And he said, absolutely. He said, the dedication and work that it takes to be good at your craft, whether the NFL or, you know, in FaZe Clan, it's, it's dedication. So yeah, there's a lot of health and wellness. There's a lot of connections that you can make. Um, even in my school and in Garden State Esports, we tie a lot directly to the health, uh, health curriculum. You know, and what's cool too, Katrina, is you can imagine, you know, when you're maybe learning about this in health class, there's not that connection. But when my kids lose, you know, and I say, okay, well, let's analyze how we did. What time did you go to bed? You know, what, what did you have for breakfast? Oh, you drank, you know, monster energy before the match. And then we could talk to them about the effect that that has right now. All, all of a sudden, figures in. Right. Yeah. That now, now they're all more interested in listening. So, you know, <laughs> um, when it's, it's a great way to make connections around, you know, some stuff that people are surprised about, like health and wellness and even mental health. We talk a lot about mental health. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I spoke a little earlier just kind of about the, the forecast and, and how these numbers continue to grow. And, and this is a global player fo forecast from 2015 to 2024. And already you can see um, just how big esports is and how much it's growing year after year. Absolutely incredible numbers. So yeah, I'll oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was, you know, for me, as somebody, uh, as an English teacher, I'm not so so great at math. I always love contexts around those numbers. And so, you know, what people maybe don't realize when you talk about the video game industry, the gaming industry, and esports is a massive part of that industry. That industry is worth more than the movie industry, the music industry, and all of North American sports combined. You know, uh, um, as as big Marvel fans, right? We saw, you know, what. Um, what uh, Disney yeah. paid for Marvel and Star Wars, but then you see what Microsoft paid for Bethesda, which is a video game company. You know, it, it wasn't even close. Microsoft paid way more for a video game company than, you know, Star Wars and Marvel combined. So it's, you know, for me, Katrina, as a teacher, again, right, esports is about social emotional learning and the other side is career and technical education yeah. because we are all preaching STEM jobs, STEM jobs, STEM jobs. Guess where a lot of them are going to be? in and around this industry with the addition of all the other um, 
you know, all, all the other traditional jobs. Like one of the biggest jobs I didn't know, Katrina, I was talking to somebody the other day, up and coming, esports contract law and esports um, agents. Incredible. So new jobs every day. Every day. I mean, did you imagine yourself in this position when you were just a kid and you're, you know, playing Mario or whatever you like to play? I mean, did you imagine yourself in this position? Years and, later? That, and what's funny, too, is like, you know, we're similar in age. I got my Nintendo when I was like five or six years old. So gaming's been part of my life. And I also now have little kids. So to be able to, you know, grow a culture of gaming in my own house is really fun. But, you know, and, and here at school, it's always the parents. Oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had this. Um, it, it's, it's really incredible. You know, it, it's, 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 it's even Garden State Esports, you know, when I started it as a way for kids to stay connected during the pandemic, like it was just a fun thing that I, I invited some teachers I knew to do. And it's blown up to half of the state of New Jersey plays in our league. And, and you know, the pandemic had a lot to do with it. I think uh, people realize the value of video games and where I had to explain esports after the pandemic, you know, families were having Fortnite Mondays together because there was nothing else to do. And now all of a sudden, like, okay, they get it. Yeah. Oh, it has been just an incredible time and incredible to see what's happened over these last uh, few years. But, you know, it, when we look at some of these professions that are born out of this, I mean, what you're seeing on the screen now, this these are just a few. I mean, every day new things are opening up, new opportunities, uh, such as the ones that, that Chris mentioned. Uh, but if we kind of go around and, and categorize some of these, I'm seeing, you know, broadcasting, communications, marketing, business, administration, um, you know, performance, media, events organization. It is just absolutely uh, just this booming industry. And I always think, you know, if, if we are not taking the opportunity opportunity to, to talk with our district leaders, to talk with our boards of education um, about really truly what esports can bring to the lives of students, then, then we're missing the mark. I mean, we're, we're missing job opportunities out there for students when they graduate high school or when they go on to college. Um, you know, how, how do you feel about that, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of times when you mention gaming, right, some folks shut down. Mm -hmm. And even when you still talk to some parents or you talk to some uh, administrators and stuff like that, you know, they just don't see it as a, uh, a real thing. And, and I think there's two impacts that maybe folks don't understand. Number one, now more than ever, kids uh, are more likely to make gaming part of their personality. Like that's who they are. They're a gamer. I'm good at games. I love to game. When you dismiss that as being something worthwhile, you are dismissing a large part of, you know, who these kids are. And then I think the other side of this too, is if you're dismissing it, you are being disingenuous to what is one of the biggest industries globally. And so you can't say out of one side of your mouth that you want opportunities and jobs and careers and, you know, college and career readiness and STEM, but out of the other side of your mouth, say video games and gaming, you know, isn't real. When this is a, even here in New Jersey, um, where I imagine most of our attendees are from, the New Jersey economic economic development has put in over a million dollars so far in infrastructure. They're trying to revitalize Atlantic City around you know esports tourism, and the casinos are heavily investing right in esports venues. Uh, we've legalized uh, esports gambling here, and conservatively, they're saying in the next couple of years it's going to be that just that piece is going to be a three or four billion dollar industry esports gambling. Imagine all the finance jobs and cybersecurity jobs that are going to be in New Jersey specifically right, to take care of that stuff. So I think sometimes that's where uh, I get frustrated is as anything, what I want for my kids is I want them to take and know every opportunity they can. Um, we're very proud at Garden State Esports. You know, we did an entire year of connecting with colleges, every college in New Jersey and some of the best programs around the uh, country. Um, and even though last year was a listing year, we were able to get uh, nine kids college scholarships for esports and uh, academic excellence, right? We have set a goal uh, through Garden State Esports, you know, with our 7,000-ish kids, uh, we want to get 5% of those kids scholarships because some of the best programs in the state and, and places even like Rowan who are planning on housing esports in their broadcasting, there's opportunities beyond gaming. 
you could get a scholarship at Boise State for being an esports journalist. You could get it, um, you know, Dr. Chris Haskell wins one of the best programs in the country. You could get a full ride for being his head of production, right? So, you know, your kids who love to make YouTube videos and love to stream on Twitch, that's virtual production. That's a, a huge job. Um, you know, even over at UCI, they give scholarships for health and wellness uh, and exercise science to help support their esports team. And so for me, um, part of my mission through Garner State Esports and doing stuff like this is I want everybody to know there's opportunities. There's 295 colleges offering $19 million in scholarships right now. And some programs won't even entertain esports where in New Jersey, Kate Maytack had three kids get college scholarships. So, you know, that's the part of it for me is that SEL piece and then that CTE college and career readiness piece because I want my kids, I want my kids in New Jersey to take advantage of every opportunity out there. And this is big business and we have to care about it. Well, you know, uh, the esports team at, at SHI, we, we follow everything that you do. We follow Garden State Esports. We love what you're doing. We love that you... Uh, are making esports so impactful for for the students in the entire state of New Jersey. It's it's amazing the work that you do. So well, thank you. <clears throat> and speaking of the work that Chris does, I want to show you a short video because we were at Ryder University. Uh, actually, this was this past June. And just to give you an idea, if you've never seen a tournament happen, if you've never seen students getting together, I want to share that with you right now. Here we go. I love a good hype video. <laughs> right? I, I mean, I, I, I get goosebumps every time I watch that video. I love it is a good just, hype video. it's so authentic. It's just, it's everything. You wrote in the chat, watch the student get mad and his coach um, consoles him. I, that's part of it, right? Well, I, I, and it really, for me, you know, I try to be very strategic in, in the content that we produce because I, I try to show a lot of stuff like that. Um, number one, you know, and I see Alex asking what game they were playing. They were actually playing multiple games. That was the Overwatch State Championship, the Knockout City State Championship, and the Rocket League State Championship. Um, but number one, like, what is some of the biggest criticism we hear about this generation? Oh, they're apathetic. They don't care. I mean, that looks like a whole lot of kids who, who care. And so, again, maybe they care about different things or they care in different ways, but we have to be you know, as educators, I believe we're here to serve them and we have to meet them where they are. And so if they love video games, well, that's why I have an esports elective, which is secretly an English class. Don't tell anybody. But through games and gaming and esports, I'm teaching them everything we want them to know. And the other side of that, too, specifically with that moment I called out, um, you know, like I tell my, uh, my, my kids, you know, on our team, and my wrestler, look, life ain't all rainbows and puppy farts. Like there's going to be bad times. You're going to lose. There's adversity. But what I love is that coach was there to jump in and console that kid and have their back. Right now, now think about this, right? Follow, follow the, 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 the logic I've convinced myself of, right? I told you, Katrina, like I've wrestled my whole life. I played football. Um, I hate losing. I hate, <laughs> I hate losing. Like I don't even, I hate losing. And, you know, you can imagine when you were playing soccer as a kindergartner and you started to get in, you lose, you get mad, you cry, you throw your headgear, you want to quit. Who is always there to, to coach me up, right? The coaches that I had. And they were there to tell me, hey, if you're not happy with what happened, well, then you need to work harder, right? They were there to help me turn my anger and frustration into motivation to do better. 
right? Again, we complain that these kids go home and they scream at the, the video games, they throw the controllers, they don't like losing either, but who's there to coach them up? So let's get them into the schools, let's get them together, and then like everything else, let's use education and educators to help solve these frustrated parents' problems around gaming, right? And so that coach was there to, to, to scoop that kid up when he just lost the state championship. Was it a miserable experience for that kid? Absolutely. Is it an experience that he's going to remember and hopefully use to grow and, and find, a, find a motivation in the future, no matter what he does? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so for me, again, like that's what it's all about. Um, so it, it's, it's stuff like that, you know, even uh, um, uh, there's another video we put together of our um, smash championship. And specifically going through the video, I saw like this really cool kind of um, trend and I've seen it uh, uh, throughout a bunch of our events, a bunch of dads, big dads, dads who probably played football, dads who probably wrestled, you know, and they're there watching their kids participate in the smash tweet and they're cheering their kids on. But I have the dads turning to each other. Are we winning? What's happening? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but the fact that they're there to support their kids, and maybe it's not, you know, the sport that they want to be to play, or, you know, uh, not that esports athletes don't play sports, right? 66% uh, of Garden State esports are actually multi sport athletes who play. Um, but just another way to celebrate kids. You know, I'll even this last, you know, I get, I get excited, Katrina. It's hard for me to oh, stop. I know. But you, I, you get me hyped up just but, listening. You know, <laughs> I, I, a couple of years ago, I had a set of grandparents fly in from Georgia all the way to New Jersey for just oh, a regular, just, just a regular match. No big deal. And, you know, I didn't know them because you get to know the people, obviously, who come and watch the, you know, stuff like that. And they just told me they've never been able to come to something like this to support their grandson. So they weren't going to miss the opportunity to be there for them because that was the first time the kid was ever in the spotlight it was during something like this. And mm -hmm. so for me, right, this is what it's all about. Love it. We uh, we had a question here in the chat from Jerry. Um, are girls and boys equally represented in esports, or as the video depicts, is the sport dominated by boys? And I'll I'll kind of give my my answer if you don't mind, Chris. And then sure. I'd love to turn it over to you because we actually you and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, so what I'm seeing, at least from my side of things in esports, um, you know, is that typical domination uh, of boys in esports. But I think it too depends on the game. I think there's also games that that women gravitate more towards. Some of the the creation, the building, the sandbox games, and then um, you know, and then I see boys gravitating towards you know, some of the, you know, Smash and some of these other games, Overwatch, some of these other ones that, that you have. But when Chris and I were talking yesterday, he was showing me, he actually has a, a, a camera that shows his classroom and shows his students. And the first thing I said is I said, how many, how many girls are in your class? Uh, how many are, are a part of esports? And uh, I was elated to hear Chris's answer. So how did you answer that, Chris? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, Next semester, I have 29 girls out of about 70 or so students, but really it should be 50-50, right? We're looking to get 50% of uh, the kids in my class should be women because that's what we're looking for. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot to unpack, right? That's such a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, you're 100% correct. It's about the game, right? Super Smash Brothers is one of the most diverse games that you can offer, which is why we offer it every season. Um, we just added Fall Guys, which is like an obstacle course game because that's a highly, you know, a highly uh, high interest game for, for women. Um, you know, you could do things like start all girls leagues or mixed teams and stuff like that. So there's things that we can do to be intentional about recruiting more girls. But I have to tell you, the biggest thing is, is we need to address our boys. And that's a big part of what I do is make sure that my boys understand that that, you know, treating people boys, girls, black, white, gay, you know what I mean, like there's a way to treat people. Um, and a big part of this and why we should care, and this is going down to, I've taught STEM down to fourth grade. I've taught esports electives down to fourth grade. And I see it where, you know, the girl walks in and they're not taken seriously. They're gamer girls. And a lot of these kids are just repeating what they hear from their favorite streamer, maybe their older brother, or a lot of it is microaggressions where they don't even realize or they're not intentionally trying to be disrespectful. Um, but we need to, as educators, right, again, bringing into the schools are ways that we can start to shape this behavior. 
Um, you know, and we should care because the same kids who do that in esports are the same kids um, who did that in my STEM classes. And then we wonder why there's a mass exodus of girls mm -hmm. in STEM around eighth grade because we're not addressing this. And it's not, um, you know, we can be intentional, but we also have to change behaviors. It's systemic across all of the STEM industries. And, uh, you know, look, we got work to do in Garden State Esports. 51% uh, of our kids are kids of color. 12%, uh, I'm sorry, 11% uh, of the league is female. That needs to hey, be but that number is growing. Well, and you know what it comes back to is I always tell this story is when I started my very first esports team almost six years ago, first year, all boys, yeah. right? The second year I had my first girl come out. She loved Rocket League and she only came out though because her two older brothers were on the team and she knew that they would have her back. Oh. Year three, she brought three friends with her. And then by year four, half of my team were girls. So the other thing too, is we have to create that safe, inclusive space because it takes time for them, uh, you know, uh, uh, it takes time for them to check out and make sure like this is a place for me. So we use team charters at Garden State Esports. We have expectations that we hold every program to. And part of that is around being as a safe, inclusive space for anybody. Um, and, and I think over the years, if we could get more folks to do that, especially when it's the professional Sorry. industry, no, you're good. Especially the professional industry, um, I think we're gonna to start to see those changes, but it starts with yeah. education. I mean, Chris, we could have a whole one-off webinar on just middle school esports, oh, right? Absolutely. And, and getting getting girls involved in middle school esports, the games that are involved, how does that blend over into the curriculum? And yeah. then obviously, how does that feed into high school? So that's an entirely, uh, a whole other conversation, you but you know, one that is definitely worthwhile. So, um, so next up, I wanted to share with you some of our spaces that, that we've actually gone around the country, we've designed, uh, we've brought to middle schools, high schools, uh, colleges, and, you know, talk about some of the aspects of these. And then we're going to jump into, well, how do we get to this point? How do we get here? How do we build this? So this was a space uh, or is a space in um, Illinois. And so when we jump in and start designing the spaces, this is typically um, kind of how we move about things. We, we create a rendering, we talk about the technology involved. Um, but one thing that I will say when we're helping to build out these programs, um, I will say that the equipment conversation, the technology, the hardware, that actually comes last. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about what is your mission? What is your vision of esports? What do you want for your students? How does this, how is this cross curricular? How does this blend into what you already have going on in STEM and in CTE? And so uh, while, you know, these, these designs look amazing, um, you know, really that technology usually comes in last when we talk about things. Would you, would you agree with that, Chris? Absolutely. Even when I counsel the programs at Garden State Esports around technology, my first question is, tell me about your learning goals, and I'll tell you how mm. to incorporate it. And I think the other thing, too, is understanding that what you're seeing is not an investment in esports, it's an investment in STEM. And, yes. and similar, you know, I have the ability to show multiple camera angles in my classroom um, because we're doing a lot, you know, here with STEM. But as I, as I flip my camera, and you can see a very real classroom and Look, are the, the ones the, that you're showing super pretty? Absolutely. Is one day this space going to be super pretty? Absolutely. But Takes those, time. Right. Those same technology you know, that you're looking at, I actually think those might be the same computers I have in my room. Um, those are what we're doing 3D design on. We're doing video game design. We're doing video editing. We're doing graphic design. So understanding that during the day, my computers are used every minute for STEM learning. And then they magically transform into, um, you know, uh, uh, the esports program after school. Really, you know, when you make an investment in esports, what you're really saying is number one, we're investing in STEM. Number two, when you make it look cool, because I understand those uh, uh, those computers that you know you're using for CAD, they just added some cool LED lights to them. You know what I mean? Like it's the same. A CAD computer is the same as an esports computer, right? CAD computer may even need to be more powerful than an esports mm -hmm. computer. Because esports is really about what performance, not about looks, right? So you can run a lot of these esports games on a potato. But what you're saying is, hey, we can have this really great after school program that's gonna, you know, meet the needs of a lot of these kids.
But during the day, we're going to offer, you know, some of the best STEM electives uh, that we can using those same machines. And then for me, you know, uh, um, especially as a wrestler where we say, uh, you know, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you look in the world of wrestling. Um, you know, when you throw up the lights and you throw up the cool designs, what you're really telling kids is you care about them, right? We, we uh, uh, want to, you know, do the best for you. We want to give you a space to be a proud of. And I'll tell you, I mean, SHI makes some of the best spaces I've ever seen. What you guys did down in Brigantine um, mm -hmm. uh, with Glenn Robbins' kids, mm -hmm. that space is my favorite space in the state. That is one of the coolest rooms I've ever seen. And then again, they're in my league. I talk to the coach. I talk to the kids to see their faces like when they're in that room or when, you know, they did the big reveal of what the room looked like because they kept it, you know, hidden for all, you know, this time, you know, it's, it's, it lets them know that you care about them. And then on top of, you know, this is just a great space for learning. I see small group areas. I see one-on-one -on -one areas. I see second spaces. I see third spaces for learning. Um, you know, so having done this for a long time, you know, the inclusive space and then what you put in the space it does impact stuff it does it does and i i want to kind of put a pin in um what you were saying about how it crosses over to to stem and and uh the cad computers i want to come back to that when we start talking about how do we obtain you know hardware how do we get funding for an esports lab so i want to come back to that in just a moment so um so let's look at, uh, we talked a little bit about opportunities for students. Um, and I quickly just wanna look at, you said, Chris, there's 200 and did you say 95 colleges and universities offering scholarships now? Yep, that data is I think two or three years old. I, I have it memorized, yes, yeah. but I, I, gotta, I gotta get the new one. I haven't seen it aggregated anywhere, but uh, well, last was yeah. 200, at least 295 colleges offering $19 million in scholarships. Incredible. The opportunities out there are just uh, enormous. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll share a, a, a short story. Uh, I'm friends with a superintendent who his son actually had a full ride to a university mm -hmm. uh, to play baseball. And um, <laughs> the the son actually ended up turning down the full ride to go and play esports for a different university. So <laughs> this is this is, and I believe he ended up on scholarship for for esports as well. But that's how big uh, esports is, and and some students are are choosing esports over some of our traditional sports um, or or other areas. So um, you know some of the opportunities right now. I, I, I put up just an example of a, a university in Connecticut, but um, they offer a major and a minor in esports. So students can go to school and study esports. Um, it, it's just absolutely amazing. We're seeing programs like these grow across the country, opportunities grow, um, and we're seeing more and more students enroll in, in programs such as this one. Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, you know, New Jersey centric. I was on the, uh, I was on a call with Stockton the other day. Mm -hmm. I've been on a call with Rowan recently, Fairleigh Dickinson. Uh, and it's exciting because these colleges are all taking it from a different angle. Like FDU is a business angle. Uh, Stockton, yeah. you know, what I love about Stockton is they're doing it under hospitality and event planning. Um, you're looking at Rowan, it's probably going to be under broadcasting. And so you have all of these different avenues that colleges are exploring. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I mentioned, there's esports journalism. Uh, you know, so it's pretty cool to see all the different directions mm -hmm. that people are, you know, celebrating what we can help kids do. Yeah. And I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. It right? I mean, we see it does. And we see, like you said, we see it under hospitality. We see it under athletics. We see it under student services. Um, you know, I mean, all over. And um, it's just kind of what works for for your yeah. college, I mean, for your institution, for your for your high school, right. middle school, yeah. whatever. And, and what the best college programs are doing, you know, is similar to the schools like mine, where I have one of the first esports electives in the state that I teach. A lot of this is being driven by, you know, workforce data um, from the Department of Labor. You know, it's being put under communications. It's being put under hospitality. Uh, you know, uh, ACC's, you know, I heard going to have it with cybersecurity and IT because those are the most in-demand jobs in the state of New Jersey. And so to, you know, to, to develop these programs around labor, 
course, we're testing the bells during the webinar. Um, when, when <laughs> hey, else this we, is real life right here, Chris. When, when else? Oh, never mind. Still my other camera angle. When else will we do it? But yeah, <laughs> so I mean, it, it's it's not like they're housing these aspects of the program willy nilly. Like this is all backed up by like work, you know, workforce department of labor. And as I'm learning in the work that we're doing with Garden State Esports, high need, high wage, high skill. So they're putting the esports degrees in high need, high wage, high skill areas. Yeah. So um, yeah, speaking of, of colleges and, and careers and jobs, um, for fun, I went out and just did a search, a job search for anything esports. You see, I, I typed in uh, the box, the search box, just esports. And this came up with uh, 1,655 jobs yeah. uh, right now in the U.S. Uh, for esports. And every day that I search this, that number continues to grow. And it's anything around any of these areas that you've mentioned, Chris. Can, can I tell you, since I saw you do this, I steal this from you and I do this too when I have like <laughs> parent nights and stuff. Well, and don't forget is I'm sandwiched between Philadelphia and New York. Yes. When I do the same search, it's tens of thousands and not a single one of these jobs, right, is less than $85,000 a year. Mm. So it's just, yeah, I still, so thanks for that. That's one of my favorite things to do. Like Yay. I'm back, like I'm back to school nights. Why? Hey, it's real, right? I mean, there this, it is. you don't get any more real than this. I mean, right. it's out there. And again, if we are not offering our students the opportunities to even, you know, uh, be skilled in these areas and these jobs, you know, we're, we're, we're missing it. We're missing it. Or even mark, look so. on the screenshot, copywriter, traditional job. Yeah. They, just, they just slap esports in front of it. Esports right. lawyer, esports marketing, esports copywriter, esports journalist, because it's just a whole field that is incredibly high interest and incredibly high demand. Yep. So in our last uh, few minutes here together, how do we get started, Chris? How do we how do we start from beginning to to you know some of those rooms that we saw just a little bit ago? Um, yeah. And I have some some tips for you, and then uh, you know would love to turn it over to Chris to talk about this because Chris is he's done this. He, he actually started the first middle school esports program in the country. True so story. you have you have the expert on here. So, um, but first, I would suggest surveying your students. Let's, let's find out the interest first. How many students in your building or in your district or school or however you want to organize it, how many are interested? And what I always find out is um, that number is huge. Um, those those surveys come back with a, a huge amount of interest. And some of you may think, well, gosh, if, if 200 students come back and say they're interested, what am I going to do with all 200 students? What am I going to do with them? And I'll tell you, they all have a place in esports. And I'm going to let Chris tackle that in just a moment. Um, but you also have to think about what types of games do we want to offer? And Chris touched on that a little bit, you know, to make sure we've got a, a wide um, choice of games to get, you know, uh, females interested in games, to get, you know, whoever comes into esports, we want to just make sure that uh, there's lots of choice for them. Um, how much time do they spend on video games? So this kind of goes into who's going to coach, who's going to take care of your students that are a part of this, who's going to monitor how much time they're they're playing or when esports takes place on campus. Um, you know, when do they practice? Is this a club activity that's after school? Is it embedded into the school day? Um, and don't forget to survey your staff because when you're going out to look for a coach who's going to to help uh, these students and who's going to be the you know, kind of the, the champion for these students, um, you might be surprised with who comes forward on your, your staff of, of educators and who might be interested in this. So uh, Chris, I'm gonna come back to you for a couple of minutes, um, you know, to go over some of these. So, so how did you get started and, and what are some tips that you have? Yeah, um, so I'm gonna go real high level because there's also a version of this where you get way into the weeds and like some best practices I've learned from starting, you know, hundreds of programs, but real high level. Number one, it's easy. If you're near New Jersey, you're going to go to Garnet State Esports uh, com, GSE Sports. I'm sorry, GSE Sports .org, um, and we have a, a join page that tells you the basic steps to getting started. But number one, uh, get stakeholder buy-in. Right, talk to your board of education, talk to your super. Um, and as much as I love to tell you, people are joining for competitive gaming. They are not. They're joining for SEL and CTE. So that's where you want to go in talking about how you're going to make SEL, healthy gaming habits, uh, and introduce students to careers, right, in a way that they want to engage with. Uh, and as part of that stakeholder meeting, and so often forgot, please do not leave IT out of the conversation. 
the earlier and the faster you can get IT on board with esports, the easier it's going to be because uh, if IT is not on board, uh, they can very quickly derail an esports program. You know, and, and with half the state playing in New Jersey, and I actually have IT folks that are on staff now at Garden State Esports, so that way they can speak IT to IT folks. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of best practices about how to do this safely from an IT perspective, but do not leave them out of the conversation. And then next, right, you said is let's talk to the kids. Um, one of the biggest pieces of advice I could give is make sure the kids know the level of commitment that they're signing up for. This isn't a video game club when you show up and just feel like, you know, when you feel like it, this is a commitment, right? In New Jersey, we follow the NJSIAA schedule, right? Eight week seasons, four week playoffs, and then we start a new season. So these kids are expected to be at practice or at a match after school, just like your traditional athletes. Um, and so a lot of kids, you know, uh, think esports is, you know, just a, a video game club and stuff like that. But really what you want to do is you want to make sure you're competing against other schools and you want to be running it like a traditional sports programs. But, you know, again, taking advantage of the things that make it unique, like the fact that we can play remotely, right? So you can play from one school against another school. Um, no travel budget, stuff like that, which is always nice. Um, but understanding, you know, uh, 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 just the, the different nuances of, of esports versus traditional sports. So once you talk to the kids, once you figure out what they want to do, right, have them all get together, figure out what game you're going to play, right? We can go back and forth, um, you know, about like what game you're going to offer, the level of the game you're going to offer, stuff like that. Uh, and then this is once I have stakeholder buy and once I know what my kids want to play. Right, so that's where then we do that needs assess uh, needs assessment mm -hmm. around of uh, uh, technology, right? So in, in a place like Keyport, we actually had to upgrade from a one gig uh, uh, connection to a two gig connection to be able to play, um, you know, and, and that was an investment my school was willing to make because they believe in what we're doing here. Um, you know, we got these computers, uh, and I called in a lot of favors, and you know, a lot of folks don't realize you can use ESSER funding for a lot of this stuff. Um, we were able to, you know, get the 25 computers I teach with during the day, I game with after school. Um, but, you know, for me, once we have the stakeholder buying, once we know what the kids want, once, all, you know, everybody's kind of had a voice and, and, you know, now we can say, okay, what do we have? What do we need? Um, you know, and this is the point where I say, all right, let's get on, let's get on a call with Katrina and her team. Um, because the one thing, you know, I love about you guys and you personally and why I continue uh, beyond being your friend for a decade is you guys are 100% real about what schools need um, and you get schools to where they need to be. And then, you know, I, I like to watch as they expand, you know, they bought, you know, or needed X and then year two it was Y and then year three it was E. And now they're, you know, a full formed program with all the cool stuff that they saw, uh, you know, in, in your in your videos. But, you know, a lot of programs don't start that way. Like you just saw, you know, MySpace and I'll flip over the camera again, just because, I mean, when have you ever seen anybody have multiple camera angles on a webinar? <laughs> I have the devices that I need. My room is definitely not cool. That's a second year project for me. And, and again, that's a second year project, but I also run the entire league. So you're seeing as somebody who's in the know, I know that this is a second year project for my school and I'm okay with that. I accomplished year one, being able to play. Uh, and a big part of that is because SHI, one of the things I love about you guys, uh, besides that you keep it real and you're not trying to uh, uh, take advantage of schools, um, is that you guys do uh, incredible grant work and your ability to find money through ESSER and stuff like that is fantastic because number one, I know nothing about it. Uh, but number two, you can imagine an educator's plate, administrator's plate, uh, plate is so full to have you guys be able to support them by going out and finding the grants and stuff for them. Um, honestly, I really believe that's part of why we're so successful in Garden State Esports is you guys handle a large part of that for our, uh, our teams. So number one, thank you for, for being part of the movement. Um, but number two, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you wanna jump into to the grant process, is I just say talk to Katrina. I don't actually know, I don't I don't actually know what happens because grants are you know up here. Yeah. So thank you so much, Chris. I mean, we like I mentioned earlier, we love working with you, working with all the schools, um, you know, across uh, New Jersey and the entire country. So, but we know you know budget it's an issue. Um, where do we get the funding for this? And um, 
you know, one of the things that you'll see under the, the please note section here is, is when you're filling out this form for, for funding, and this is through SHI, this is through our grants office, it's completely free to you uh, to fill this out. But when you're filling it out, we want to make sure that we're tying esports into STEM and CTE. So if you remember, I said we were going to circle back around to Chris's um, uh, point about his CAD computers because um, Chris obtained funding by putting esports into uh, STEM and CTE. Um, so if we do that and we obtain hardware that can be utilized during the day for other courses, whether that's marketing or design or art or something like that, and then dual purpose them for esports, obtaining that funding is, is a lot easier. So the process with grants, you fill out the form, which takes two seconds. Um, we send that into our grants office. Uh, in about seven to 10 business days, we bring a huge report back to you. It's a, this 50 page huge report that has all the different grants that you are eligible to apply to. And then from there, if you have a grant writer on staff, um, you know, you're able to, to write that grant, or if you need assistance with writing a grant, we do have grant writers that it does that there is a fee for that, but um, we do have grant writers that that can help. So we don't ever want funding to be a, a barrier um, to starting esports in your school. So I think uh, as we uh, close this out today, just remember to uh, begin with the end in mind. You know, what, what do you want for your students? Um, and, and again, this is why I always say, start with that mission and vision. You know, ultimately, what do you want your students to get from this? Um, uh, and some things, other things to think about, you know, do you want this to be competitive or do you just want it to be, you know, a club that students get together and play? Um, how are you gonna host tournaments? If you're gonna host tournaments, um, are you gonna have courses of study? Are you gonna bring curriculum into the day-to-day -day, uh, of your middle school and high school? Um, and I wish, you know what, Chris, we need to have a third webinar on community partners because Chris is a wizard at uh, getting the community involved and getting um, you know, stakeholders involved with the businesses within the communities to help um, you know, sustain uh, the, the programs around the state of New Jersey and beyond. Um, and then, you know, we also want to look at, at college and jobs and recruitment and scholarships and all those things that that we went over. So there's a lot to take into consideration before even building um, or starting a build like that. So uh, I know we only have two minutes left, so I definitely want to put up our um, our contact information here again, just in case you want to get in touch with us. Um, I'm trying to keep up with some of the questions here. Uh, we have some NASIF, some SSEL questions. Um, and so, Alex, I, I think we'll probably have to get back to you on that if you want to send us a message. Um, but here's some more contact information for you just on the SHI side of things. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, please feel free to reach out. If you want to talk to the esports team at SHI, um, you can. Uh, contact esports at shi.com, however you want to get in touch with everyone, but we are here for you. Um, we're always excited to talk about esports. It's always an honor and a pleasure to have Chris Aviles on and, and get to talk with him. So, um, so thank you everyone uh, for being here today. And I want to turn this back over to Michael to close us out. Thank you so much, Dr. Atkins. Thank you as well, Chris. A lot of great information as always. Uh, and thank you for watching uh, live. If you're watching this on playback or recording, thank you as well. A lot of questions in the chat and uh, Katrina did have her contact information up there. I did see uh, Chris put his contact information in the chat as well. You could always go to gsesports.org um, and you could find Yep, they're perfect. Awesome. Follow them on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, I'm also going to be sending out a follow up email later this afternoon or tomorrow, whenever the, the link is generated through Zoom um, with this recording, just as a follow up. If you're registered for this, um, you being here today, you are registered, so you will receive that email. Um, and I'll copy Dr. Atkins and Chris on that follow up email as well. So you could just respond um, to us and then you know, one of us can can take the questions you may have. Um, so I hope you have a great rest of your week. Um, have a great Thanksgiving holiday. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Chris. Thank you both.
Thanks. Bye.